Well, it's good to be together. Sunday nights come round again. It's been a beautiful day, and the Lord is kind, and we've got many reasons to rejoice in Him as we come to worship tonight. Welcome to those who are watching online as well at home. Uh, I'm not going to remind you of all the notices that we mentioned this morning, lots of things going on. Uh, so just to remember them in your prayers uh, during, during the week. We're going to start by singing 772. What is our God like? What's the God like that we come to worship this evening? Well, we're reminded at the beginning of each verse of something of what our God is like. So verse 1, the Lord is rich and merciful. The Lord is very kind. So the encouragement then is to come to him. Look, oh, come to him. And then verse 2, the Lord is glorious and strong. Our God is very high. So what must we do? Trust him. Trust him. And then verse 3, the Lord is wonderful and wise, as all the ages tell. So we come to learn from from him as well. So let's be mindful of those truths as we come and as we sing and as we worship our God tonight. 772. Let's pray. Let's bow before our God. Lord God, we thank you that as we come into your presence tonight, we, we can be reminded and we can remind each other as we sing of what you are like, that you are indeed rich and merciful and very, very kind. And we, Lord, want to acknowledge that we haven't just read that in the Bible, we've experienced it in our lives. Lord, it's there in your words. You tell us that this is the God that you are, but we know that it's true because we've experienced that mercy. We've known your kindness in our lives, every day of our lives. Your mercies have been new every morning and you have been so kind. And so, Lord God, in the light of that, we do, we come to you tonight. We come again. Thank you that you invite us to come into your presence and to draw near to you. And so we're looking to you, Lord, that you will help us. Give us a believing mind. Uh, give us faith, Lord. 
Uh, without faith, it is impossible to please you, for those who come to you must believe that you are and that you are the rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And so, Lord, we pray that we might, we might come in that way tonight, knowing that we're coming to the true God and the God who, who meets with those who seek him. So, Lord, help us to come in that way. Lord, we thank you that you are indeed glorious and strong. You are high and lifted up. You are, you are the God who is without uh, comparison. That no matter what we look to, uh, nothing can be compared to you. And so, Lord God, we pray that then in the light of that, we might trust you. We might come to you. Thank you that in that we can have security. We can have that confidence and, and hope that uh, that isn't found anywhere else. Lord, we thank you that you, uh, you, in a most wonderful way, use your, your power and sovereignty for our goods so that your word tells us you're working all things together for the good of your people. Uh, Lord, we, we, uh, that is our hope and our confidence as we head out into another week because... Uh, we have all sorts of different things ahead of us and different things, Lord, that worry us and trouble us and seem too big for us. And so, Lord, our confidence is that you are over all those things. And each day of this week, as, as each day of our lives, you, you are the one who opens up the day and, and brings things about and overrules everything and is with us and watches over us and keeps us and blesses us. And so, Lord, we are looking to you. For those things and we thank you lord that you are wonderful and wise as all the ages tell as all history shows you are the wise god working out your purposes so wonderfully and we rejoice in that we thank you that you've given us the bible your book uh, and it's a light to our feet a lamp to our path and lord we we rejoice to have it together uh, this evening so lord we commit our time to you our week ahead to you in the life of the church, Lord, to various things that are going on. We thank you that we can commit them to you. Uh, we thank you for the, the ladies' meeting and the fellowship enjoyed there and the blessing that is. And for those who come along who don't yet know you. And pray that uh, as those who've been invited to the coffee morning this week, that they'll come and hear something of the gospel and of the Lord Jesus. And that it might be a means of, of working in hearts and lives for the glory of your name. Lord, we pray for the Hope Explored uh, meeting on Tuesday, and we commit that to you. You know, Lord, those who have come and those who will come, uh, those who've said that they will come, Lord, we commit all these things to you, thanking you that you are the God who, who seeks and saves that which was lost. And we pray, Lord God, that great things might come uh, through that. Thank you, Lord God, that on Wednesday we can meet together as a church for prayer. We know that we need to do that, and what days we live in. And so, Lord, we ask that as we gather then that you will meet with us and give us a spirit of prayer, not just this week, but uh, as the weeks go on, that there might be a growing uh, prayerfulness about us as a church, uh, a true wrestling with you. We thank you that we can meet. That we thank you for those times when we open your word and we consider it together. We thank you for fellowship in the truth and being able to uh, speak together about the things of God. Pray that that might flourish and grow. Uh, Lord, we pray for that then. And we thank you for the early tots and for the mums and uh, children coming along and for the contacts that that brings. And uh, Lord, we, we thank you for that opportunity. Uh, we know that uh, for, for parents bringing up little children, uh, it's exhausting and can be uh, lonely at times. We thank you that we can provide that opportunity for mums to come and spend time together and Lord we pray that it might be a means of blessing uh, and uh, of gospel opportunity and showing the love of Christ. Lord we think of the children's work on Friday and especially the, the uh, Easter special. Pray that parents will come with their children and there'll be opportunity again to hear something of the gospel and to speak with them. We thank you for the children and for the families that we have contact with. Some of them have really great needs, difficult circumstances, illness and sickness. And Lord, we pray for them. You know their circumstances and needs. And we just commit them to you for healing, for help, for grace. Uh, Lord, we pray. We're conscious, Lord God, of how needy people's lives are often. And many of them don't have the law to look to and trust in. 
And we pray that they might look to him even in their times of need. Lord, we pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the joy of meeting together then and of coming to your words tonight. We thank you for this chapter of Hebrews that we've spent these weeks in. And Lord, we ask that you will imprint these things on our minds and hearts and, and that again tonight you might give us that faith uh, that comes. Lord, you, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so there's no better place in that sense for us to be, for our faith to, uh, to grow than to be here tonight, opening your word and reading it together. So bless us, Lord, we pray. Help us now. Forgive us our sins. We commit our times to you. We pray, Lord, again, that as we, as we go out into each day, that you would help us to clothe ourselves with those beautiful garments that we considered this morning. Thank you that you call us to a life of beauty and, uh, and Christ-likeness. We feel that we f- and know that we feel, fall very far short of these things and often fail and have to come again to the cross. But we pray, Lord, that as we begin each day, we would remember who we are and whose we are. And, Lord, that we might day by day, more and more, clothe ourselves uh, with, with compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another as we have known your forgiveness. So, Lord, bless us, we pray. Continue with us tonight. We look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, number 56 from uh, the supplement 56. By faith we see the hand of God in the Lights of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. Number 56. Oh, 
Well, let's read about some of those forefathers in the faith who trusted God as we turn back again to Hebrews and chapter 11. And we'll just read from verse 30 through to the first two verses of chapter 12. So we considered verse 30 and 31 last week, and you'll see from the sheet that it's not quite getting to the end tonight. Uh, We're looking at verse 32 through to verse 38. But let's read Hebrews chapter 11 uh, from verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thankful for his words, being able to read it together, pray that. He'll speak to us as we look at that in a moment. Before we do that, let's just sing once more, this time number 42 in the supplement. Number 42. Reminder of sovereignty of God in all the perfection of all his ways, even though they might be mysterious at times. Number 42. The perfect wisdom of our God revealed in all the universe, all things created by his hand and held together at his command.
Okay, let's turn to Hebrews 11, and you'll see on the sheet we're looking at verse 32 through to verse 38. We've been going through then this great chapter about faith, and the writer has been taking us through... uh, these great men and women of faith in the Old Testament and showing us through their lives what it means to live by faith, uh, what it involves, uh, what happens when we live by faith. And we've seen, haven't we, that we begin the Christian life by faith and we live the Christian life by faith and God, with God's help we end the Christian life in faith. Faith What is it? It's that willingness, isn't it, to trust God, to trust his promises, uh, to trust his purposes in our lives, to come what may, however perplexing the path, however strong the enemy, however unseen the end might be. We, 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 We trust him, we believe his word, we live in the light of his words. We say, this is what he says, this is what he promises. This is the way he says to go, and we, and we go that way. What does the beginning of the chapter say? Faith is the, is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for, the, the, uh, the evidence, the conviction of things not seen. Well, now, it seems that the writer has just looked at his watch, or perhaps he's just realised that he hasn't got much left on his scroll, much room left on his scroll. Uh, he can't just sort of get a few bit more pieces of paper. I mean, this was a real issue. Uh, if you were writing, you know, you, you had a certain amount, and when the scroll ran out, well... Uh, so he, he says, doesn't he, what more should I... T- time's going to fail me. Now I can sympathise with this man very much. I know what it's like to look up at the clock and see... The time has flown by. Now, I realise time works differently for the person in the pulpit to the people in the pew, because time for me flies by when I'm preaching, and I know for you it all slows right down, doesn't it? And you look at your watch, thinking it must be half an hour, and it's only 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes gone. Well, the writer then, he's he's aware, he's he's, he's, he's been speaking about all these people, some of them in quite detail, hasn't he? But but he's got to hurry on. He can't do that for everybody. This scroll's not long enough to do that. He hasn't got time for that. And so he presses the fast forward button and he very quickly takes us through a whole number of other situations and people and takes us through the rest of the Old Testament in a sense and picks out a few names and mentions a few occasions and, and does so, well, of course, with God's help and the Spirit's leading so that what we have is something very purposeful and very wise and with some very vital lessons for us to learn. Now, every time I've come uh, to preach on uh, Hebrews 11, I've really felt what I've got is not very much to say. And uh, the, Lord's, the Lord helps us, so I feel exactly the same tonight. But here we are. We've got three headings, the people of faith, the triumphs of faith, and the trials of faith. And we'll just look at those together uh, for a while tonight. So first of all, the people of faith. That's verse 32. So in verse 32, look, the, the, the writer sort of fires off a list of names, doesn't he? Time will fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Here's, here's some people, I haven't got time to mention them in detail, but here's their names. And perhaps he wants us to go and read them for ourselves. That would be a good thing to do, because I'm not going to mention everything about them. And, and I'll mention some things, and you go, well, I don't know about that. And, and it would be a good thing, perhaps this week, to, to read up about these people. Here are people, and they also walk by faith. And their lives are also marked by faith as well. So let's just take a few moments to, to, uh, with these, to note a few things about these people. What have I got? I've got them. First of all, they're different people. Uh, uh, with these two headings under here. They're different people and they're flawed people. So first of all, they're different people. First of all, some of them are better known than others, aren't they? I mean, if I asked you about Samson or David, I'm pretty sure that most of us here tonight... Could, you could tell me something about David and Samson and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, some of the things that they did and were well known for. I reckon you could do that. Gideon, I reckon, again, probably most of you could remember a thing or two about Gideon. You know how his army was reduced from 32,000 down to 300 uh, before they defeated the Midianites? 
So I reckon, you know, we'd not do too bad on Gideon, I'm sure. What about Barak and Jephthah? Well, I'm sure one or two of our Bible boffs would be all right, wouldn't they? Uh, would manage to raid their memory banks and go, yeah, okay, I can remember that, what they did. But I'm guessing that without looking them up, those two, we'd, well, we might struggle with it. I mean, even my wife, she's a massive Bible buff. But we, we, she took a while to, to, to recall them uh, yesterday when I asked her about them. Uh, we can't, it'd probably take us a while to recount their stories. Well, they're in the Bible, but their stories are less well known. They're not, they're not sort of one of the main sort of characters, are they? But they're, they're mentioned here. So Barak, his, he features in Judges chapter 4. And he's used to defeat Sisera, who has an army that includes 900 chariots of iron. And Jephthah, he's in at Judges 11, and he's used to defeat the Ammonites. So they're, they're different in terms of their fame. Some, you know, faith doesn't mean you're going to be famous. Great faith doesn't necessarily mean lead to fame. So they're different in that way. They're different also in terms of their backgrounds. So Jephthah was the son of a harlot. Prostitute. So we had a prostitute last week, didn't we? And we've got the son of one this week. Judges 11, verse 1, you can read that there. And yet God raised up Jephthah to be a great man. Gideon, you remember how it all begins with Gideon? I mean, he admits himself, doesn't he? He comes from the weakest family of the smallest tribe, and he's the, he's the, he's the least in the family. I mean, it doesn't sound very promising, does it? David. Well, he comes from a godly line, doesn't he? But he's the youngest of the sons. And you younger ones, remember when, he, when, uh, when, they, when Samuel comes, they don't even get De- David in from the field, do they? When he's, they know that Samuel's going to anoint one of them king. So again, you don't have to come from a certain background to, to, uh, to be a man or woman of faith. You might look around, you go, oh, these, there's some people here who come from really, you know, they've had the Bible since they were little and they know everything and, and there's me and I don't know anything. But that doesn't make a difference. You know, when it comes to faith and trust in God, that doesn't make a difference. I mean, it's a blessing, but it, you can still be a person of great faith without it. They're also different in terms of their characters, these, these people. So again, Gideon, he's a timid man, isn't he? If you remember, he's not obvious leadership material. He's not an obvious lead an army sort of a man. When, when the, if you remember the story, when the angel of the Lord comes to him in Judges 6, he's threshing, he's threshing wheat, isn't he, in a wine press in order to hide it uh, from the Midianites. So when the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, you remember what he says? The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And you can sort of imagine Gideon looking around going, who, who Who's, is there somebody else here that the Lord's talking about? And yet our passage speaks, doesn't it, a bit later on. Do you notice, out of weakness were made strong. That does happen. Uh, David, on the other hand, I said, David's a bit more, you know, he's definitely more up for it, isn't he? He fights lions and bears, and when he comes to the battlefield, he's quite, you know, he volunteers to fight Goliath, doesn't he? Jephthah, well, you can look him up, he's called a mighty man of valor. So they're different sort of characters, aren't they? And faith is displayed by different people, not always the same characters. You don't have to be an up, out there, front sort of person to display faith. You can be timid and shy, and yet show real faith. You can be made strong in that way. Different people. They're different people, and they're flawed people as well. I mean, all the people mentioned in this verse, verse 32, had flaws of different kinds, failings of different kinds. Some of them pretty serious. So Gideon's courage was pretty shaky. If you, again, you, this is good. You go and read it again. because it's, You remember the story with the fleece? Gideon, you know, he wants various reassurances from the Lord, doesn't he, before he's going to go out into battle and he... You know, he's, his faith isn't exactly the strongest, but here he is in this chapter. Barak, uh, he's given a promise by the Lord, uh, but he wouldn't go into battle. Again, you'll have to look this all up. Without the prophetess Deborah going with him. And he ends up being, do you remember the story? Some of you do. Outshone by a woman, another woman called Jael. 
who does some good work with a tent peg, if you know, remember that part of the story. That's a great, boys, that's great to read that bit. I used to love that. I did some great Sunday school drawings of jail and a tent peg. But, you know, he's, he, he's, he's got this promise, and Deborah comes to him and says, you know, the Lord's going to give you a victory. And, and, he's, and he says, I want you to go if you come with me. So, you know, it's a, his faith isn't, doesn't seem to be that amazingly strong. Samson, well, of course, he was... I mean, he was hugely morally flawed, wasn't he? I mean, he's great strength, but also morally great weakness. Jephthah, well, oh, made a rash vow, if you read that story, and lived to greatly, deeply regret it. David, well, we know David's wonderful godliness, and yet we know that that big failure in his life, with all the impact of it. Samuel, well, I mean, he was a godly man, wasn't he? But he, he made the same mistakes as his predecessor, Eli, didn't he? And not disciplining his sons with, with tragic consequences. So, so all these people noted, people of faith, and yet their faith wasn't perfect, and their lives weren't perfect. Now, that's an encouragement to us, not... In the sense that, oh, we can relax about our sin and excuse sin. We know we can't ever do that. But we are conscious of how weak our faith is, aren't we? And we're conscious of how frail we are and how flawed we are. And, uh, and we might wonder, could God ever use me? Or, you know, have I blown it? Have I, you know, could... and yet we're reminded. No, God still uses weak, flawed people. Because it's not about how great we are or how great our strength is it's how great our god is isn't it how great our savior is so people are the people of faith not many of these were were natural humanly speaking choices for the lord and yet by faith they serve the lord the people of faith so you can you can well we've mentioned some things about them as we go on but I, let me encourage you to read their lives Secondly, then, the triumphs of faith. The triumphs of faith. Verse 33 to 35, the beginning of verse 35. By faith, these people then and others, others sort of were enabled to accomplish some pretty amazing things, actually. Let's just note them. Look, 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 follow, follow through with me. Uh, verse, uh, verse 33. Through faith, they subdued kingdoms. So, okay, so that covers... Gideon's defeat of the Midianites and Barak's the Canaanites and, and Samson's victories over the Philistines and, and Jephthah's over the Ammonites and David over the Moabites and others. I mean, they, these, they, they got some pretty, they subdued some enemies, didn't they, these, these people? How did they do it? Through great military might? No, they did it. They did it through trusting in the Lord. So you, again, I mentioned a while ago, Gideon did it, having had his army reduced from 32,000 to 300. And you remember their tactic? We thought the tactic was strange last week, didn't we? You know, the walking around Jericho seven times. You remember what happens with, with Gideon? Okay, what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to go down to the camp uh, with a torch and with a trumpet. And, and we'll, blow, we'll smash the torch so the, so the lights and, and we'll blow the trumpet and, and everything will be fine. Well, that takes faith, doesn't it, to, to do that? Trust in God, his words, his ways. In Judges 4, verse 7, Barak is given a promise. I will deliver him into your hand. Speaking about this man, Sisera, and he believes that promise. His faith is weak, but he believes that promise, and he acts on that promise, and, and the battle's won. Samson is given... Strength. Where does his strength come from? They ask that question, don't they? Where does he get his great strength? Well, it's from the Lord. And he almost single-handedly defeats the Philistines, doesn't he? And then you could think of David defeating Goliath. What amazing faith uh, that was, wasn't it? What a wonderful triumph of faith. Let me just read those words. They're 
I love to read them in 1 Samuel 17, verse 46. You come to me with sword and with spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I mean, that is faith, isn't it? Little David facing the giant Goliath. Trusting the Lord that this is the Lord's battle. He'll help me. So they subdued kingdoms. And they worked righteousness, it goes on, doesn't it? Uh, or uh, some translation, enforced justice. So this is speaking about the judges. They, they judged the people. They, they, they led the people in the right way. And often that was what happened, wasn't it? The people departed from the Lord. The Lord raised up a... Uh, well, the Lord made them their enemies rule over them. They cried out to the Lord. The Lord sent a judge, and while the judge ruled over them, they, they, they obeyed the Lord and walked in his ways. These, these, these people were enabled to do that, to, to, to establish justice. They, what, how does it go on? They obtained promises. That means they laid hold of promises, the promises of God that they were given, and they saw the fulfillment of them and the keeping of them as they trusted God. So, I mean, we could think of them, lots of them, but you could think of David, can't you? He's given a promise He's going to be king one day. And he, 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 he believes that. He waits God's timing and he, he doesn't try and take it into his own hands and, and he sees it fulfilled. He obtained the promise. How does it go on? Stop the mouths of lions. Verse 33. That's probably referring to Samson and David. You remember? Both were given the Lord's help to kill lions at various points. Uh, Samson in protecting himself, David in protecting the sheep. I think the writer's most likely also got Daniel in mind as he writes those words. Daniel, whose faith in the Lord meant he wasn't going to stop praying, uh, even though there was the threat of the lions, then he's going to trust God. And, and he saw the, mouths, the lion's mouth stop, didn't he? Oh, one reason for thinking the writer has Daniel in mind is because of the next one, look. Quench the violence of fire. That seems most likely to be referring to Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were prepared to face the fiery furnace, weren't they, rather than bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. Again, let me read those words to you from Daniel chapter 3. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, if you throw us into the fiery furnace, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to your king that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. That's incredible faith, isn't it? We're going to trust God. We're going to do what's right. And they saw, they came out unscathed. Well, how does it go on? It's escape the edge of the sword. I might be referring to David's escape from Saul, Elijah from Jezebel, Jeremiah from Jehoiakim. Out of weakness were made strong. Well, that could be referring to any of them. They were all weak, weren't they? They were all feeble in themselves, and yet the Lord strengthened them. Became valiant in battle. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens or the foreign armies. Uh, many of these people showed incredible courage. As God gave them faith, as they trusted in the Lord. And then look at the beginning of verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. That must surely be referring to the widow of Zarephath, whose son Elijah restored to her, and, uh, and, the, and the, 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 the child of the, the Shunammite woman, who Elisha was raised by Elisha. These women trusted the Lord. They looked to the Lord, and they saw death defeated. So what do we have in those, two, those verses? We have triumphs of faith don't we we have victories won we have deliverances we have strength given we have the impossible happen and it's all by faith trusting god trusting his word trusting his promises see seeing him at work that's what we have now what about us we don't well we don't need uh we don't need to defeat armies uh it's unlikely we're going to need strength to kill a lion unless something terrible happens at banham zoo one time when you're there or something like that and we're not looking to raise the dead. And yet, in another way, we are wanting all those things. 
I mean, there are spiritual forces of darkness that need to be pushed back. And how did Peter describe Satan? Like a roaring lion, seek, prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. And we want the spiritually dead raised, don't we? Well, how do any of those things happen? By faith, trusting God, trusting his word, believing his promises, walking in his ways. That's how they, that's how they happen. All of those things are possible, aren't they? By faith, as we look to the Lord and trust his words. Go back to that expression uh, in, in uh, where is it, in, in verse, um, verse 33. Obtained promises, in the middle of that, verse 33. Uh, there's something sort of uh, proactive, I don't like that word, but about that, I think. It, you know, it, it seems, that in, at least certainly in some cases, that they're looking for a promise. They're, they, they're laying hold of the promises. And, uh, and, 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 and living in the light of them and proving God to be faithful in them. So there are so many wonderful victories, so many wonderful triumphs in the Bible. And they give us courage, they give us hope. They, they, they remind us that uh, I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. What did, what did we read? By faith this mountain, well we sang it, didn't we? By faith this mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name. So these stories should make us bold and courageous. Uh, On Thursday evening, uh, at the online uh, United prayer meeting, Luther took us to, uh, let's just turn there a moment just to keep you awake. 1 Samuel chapter 14, um, uh, the account of Jonathan and his armor bearer uh, taking on a whole garrison of Philistines. Uh, 1 Samuel 14, and there's that lovely statement in verse 6 where Jonathan says, you know, come, let, let's go over to this garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So Jonathan doesn't know for sure what the Lord will do. You know, he says, who, who, who knows? It may be that the Lord will, will work for us. He hasn't got a specific promise from the Lord, like some of these others had, to say, you're, you're going to defeat this army. But he knows what the Lord's like. He, he knows nothing can restrain the Lord from saving, whether by many or few. And so he, he goes in that, with that promise, with that assurance. And Luther was encouraging us, on Thursday evening, to be optimistic, to be bold, to be courageous. We could think of that expression from William Carey, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. That sort of, the triumph of faith. Or that we might see more of them. We might have that faith to trust the Lord more. So there's the triumph of faith. And then, Thirdly, the trials of faith. That's the second part of verse 35 through to verse 38. For some reason, I can't, I don't quite know why it came up. Funny things come up, don't they, on your YouTube feed or your Facebook feed. I, I had a, came up on this week on my feed, a, a sermon by Joel Olstein came up. I was tempted to play it to you, a bit of it to you this evening. Not because it's uh, so good, but because it's so unbelievably bad. Uh, Joel Olstein, if you don't know who he is, he's one of these, uh, uh, the most, perhaps the most famous celebrity uh, pastor in the USA. He's got a huge church with an even larger uh, online following, a multi-million pound enterprise that enables him to live in a multi-million pound house and uh, private jet and celebrity lifestyle. He preaches this prosperity gospel that, you know, that teaches as long as you don't have any negative thoughts, as long as you sort of believe that good is going to come your way, then God will bless you and all, the, all your trials will soon be gone and everything in your life will prosper. And in this particular sermon, it was just, well, it's quite unbelievable to listen to it, really. It's from last weekend, I think. You can, you can probably look it up. He was assuring everyone that their trials were temporary and would soon they were going to be coming into something better. Uh, your barrenness, this, these were his words, your barrenness will soon be over, your, your illness will soon be finished, your debts will soon be paid off, your partner will soon come, uh, your promotion will soon come, it'll be soon. 
And he, and he quotes from one, sort of quotes, doesn't get anyone to turn it up, but quotes from, from 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. Our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, uh, you know, are going to be something much better soon coming. They're just for a moment. And with a smile, he manages to preach completely the opposite of what the passage is, is actually saying. Uh, uh, assuring everyone, your trials are they're soon going to be over. That will soon be gone. That will soon be over. You'll be, you'll be, the sun will be shining very soon, within a very short while. That's what we're saying. They also note the very next verse says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, the things which are seen are temporary, the things which are unseen are eternal. I mean, he's got his book, isn't it? It's the, Your Best Life Now. It's false teaching that millions and millions of people across the world, or those dear people in Nigeria have been duped by in, in their poverty. But the New Testament doesn't teach that, and this passage doesn't teach that. So he goes on, he doesn't just speak about the triumphs of faith, he speaks about the trials of faith as well. Because people of faith don't always see triumph. Sometimes they see trials. Sometimes it doesn't end in victory, humanly speaking, in this life. Sometimes it doesn't end in, in, in deliverance. Sometimes it ends in prison. Sometimes it ends in a pool of blood while the stones are hammering down on you. That's how it ends for some people. By faith. Sometimes their faith doesn't end in, in deliverance. It ends in that way. And that's the point, I think, of this second section. There are people who, who show their faith by refusing a way out, by being willing to suffer, by trusting God, even when everything goes wrong and there isn't a victory. So look, how does verse 35 go on? Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. That word tortured is, is a graphic word actually for being pulled on a rack and beaten how many believers down through the ages have refused the offer of a pardon and freedom that they've been offered if they will only recant only deny the gospel just say the words so in July 1531 a man called John Frith was burned at the stake in Smithfields in London. John Frith was a great friend of William Tyndale, who we have to be so thankful for, for translating the Bible into the English language. He'd been with Tyndale on the continent. Tyndale had been away on the continent. He'd come back to England and was captured. Frith was offered a pardon by Henry VIII if he would only promise not to preach ever again. And this is what he wrote. I assure you that I neither will nor can cease to speak. For the word of God burns in my body like a fervent fire. All he had to do was say, okay, I won't preach anymore. And he'd have been released. Instead, age 28, along with another young man from Kent, he was burnt at the stake at Smithfields that year. Why? Well, he wouldn't accept deliverance from the king, that he might obtain a better resurrection. He believed that, there's, that, that this life is temporary, it's fleeting, and he, he's, he, he had a hope for a resurrection to come. I mean, we're, uh, that, the Nigerian girl, Leah, still, as far as I'm aware, in, uh, because she won't recant. She won't become a Muslim. Many of the other girls have been released, but she, she's still there because of her faith. How does it go on? Others, still others had trial of mocking and scourging, yes, and chains and imprisonment. That was true, wasn't it? Many of those faithful Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, Micaiah, Hananiah, all spent time in prison. Many of them were scorned, many of them were abused because they were, they were faithful, because they trusted God. Interestingly, a fairly well-established tradition is that Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, was sawn in two by King Manasseh. Now, that may or may not be 
actually true. It's quite a, a long-standing tradi Jewish tradition. But what, whether, whether that was the case or not, the writer speaks, doesn't he, in verse 37, of people who were sawn in two for the gospel. They were stoned. Zechariah was stoned to death in the court of the Lord uh, for being faithful to him. They were tested. They were killed with a sword. What, what, do we, what else do we read? They wandered around, not in thousand-pound designer suits like the tele-evangelists, but in sheepskins and goatskins. They're destitute. They didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have anything to have. They didn't know where the next meal was coming from. Because they, all by faith, all because they trusted God and, and, and wouldn't uh, carry on in the, as the others did. They were kept in caves, dens and caves of the earth. You can think of Obadiah. You remember Obadiah in the years of Ahab and Jezebel hiding a load of prophets in, a, in, in the caves? And the truth is that it's faith, trusting God, being convinced of this truth and being convinced of his promises might mean for us that in this life we lose everything. It might mean we have to endure great trials. It might mean we lose our life. We might lose everything. And the world will look on and shake its head and go, that is absolutely mad. But what is faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's how we have to live, isn't it? By Faith looks beyond this world, beyond what's seen, beyond what's temporary, to that, to that resurrection day. There's a better resurrection. Jesus has risen from the dead. So that, this is encouraging, isn't it? Because you, know, you may be here tonight and you may not feel very triumphant and victorious. You may feel exactly the opposite of that. You may feel your life's one big trial and... And maybe that's the way you've got to show your faith. And actually, maybe the very fact that you're here tonight is a, is a sign of great faith. You're still trusting the Lord, even though your life's extremely perplexing. I love the fact that it's in actually in this little section, isn't it, that it says in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. I mean, I'm sure it sort of... It does refer to those, you know, triumphs of faith, but it's good that it's in that little section about those who really suffered. They, they, these are the true heroes, in other words. These are the ones that the world doesn't deserve to have among them. These are the great ones, not necessarily the ones who saw the great victories, but the ones who endured to the end, who kept going. Well, it is relevant for us, isn't it? I think, I'm sure it is relevant for us because... It's an increasingly hostile society, and the cost of following Jesus, you know, unless things change, is going to get greater. And that's the sort of faith that we're going to need to display, isn't it? Not, not necessarily triumphalist faith, but that faith that goes, we're going to trust God and believe his words and proclaim his gospel and stand on his promises, even though we lose everything, even though... We're mocked, even though we're, we're laughed out of, out of town. We're going we're gonna to trust God, even though we lose our jobs, even though we lose our livelihoods, our friends. That might be where, where our faith has to be displayed. But when we get to glory, it will, it will be, it will seem, uh, well, let's, 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 uh, let's, uh, Let's interpret those verses properly, shall we? From 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Our light affliction is but for a moment. This life, and it's, it's but for a moment, but it's, it's working for us, isn't it? A far more an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You don't look at the things that are seen. We're looking at things which are unseen. Are you living in that way tonight? You, are you trusting the promises of God? Trusting God? Christ, who's risen from the dead, is your hope beyond this world? What a blessed thing if it is. That's how we're called to live, trusting the Lord. So the people of faith, all different sorts of people, just like us tonight. The triumphs of faith, well, let's, let's pray for victories. Let's look for advance. Let's look for great things, the impossible happening. But when the trials come, let's not despair. Let's not lose heart. Let's keep trusting the Lord, even in the midst of those. Well, let's... 
Let's sing as we finish, shall we? Let's uh, conclude the day by singing 793. Seven hundred and ninety-three for all thy saints who from their labours rest, who thee by faith before the world confess, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that there does one day break a more glorious day. A day is coming of resurrection and final victory. We pray that we might trust you and live our lives in the light of that, whether that's in triumph or through trials, uh, that we might follow you and trust your word. Bless us now, Lord, we pray, in our fellowship together and then 
Keep us and watch over us and be with us as we head out into the week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.